So far, we've been talking about a lot over the first five chapters of the book of Exodus. We've looked at Moses' life as being raised as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. We looked at him in his 40 years in the Mount Sinai region, the Sinai uh, uh, Peninsula, as a shepherd for his father-in-law Jethro, who was a priest uh, from the uh, nation of Midian, who were descendants from... Anybody remember where the Midianites come from? Y'all know. Midian. M- yeah, Midianites, <laughs> they trace their lineage back to what patriarchal figure? Abraham, right? Abraham through Keturah, right? The wife he marries after the death of Sarah. And so related to Abraham's offspring, related to the Israelites, Moses marries Zipporah. He has two sons, Gershom and Eliezer, and they are going back to Egypt. Now, when he gets to Egypt, he goes to Pharaoh and he says, you know what, you're going to let my people go. And Pharaoh says, I don't know you. I don't know this Yahweh you're talking about. Get out of my sight. And then Pharaoh does what to the people of Israel? makes them work harder by taking away their straw, right? And so they're not able to fulfill the number of bricks they're supposed to be made. And so what do the Egyptian taskmasters do to the Israelite foremen? They beat them, right? And we talked about last week about how Moses killed an Egyptian taskmaster for beating one Israelite. And now he sees dozens of Israelites being beaten in front of him over what he thinks is his fault, right? Something that he has done. And so when we close the end of chapter 5, how is Moses emotionally? Broken, yeah. I mean, the, the people look at him and say, you're a liar, right? He goes from being a hero to a zero. They say, may God curse you and judge you for what you've done. And so they don't think that Moses is a spokesman for God at all. They think he is a charlatan who has now caused this oppressed, oppression to fall upon them. And so you see that Moses is pretty broken. And then we ended last week with verse 1 of chapter 6, where God tells Moses, Hold on, Moses. I'm, I'm, I'm going to free the people of Israel. You just wait and you just see. And that's exactly what we're going to pick up with tonight. One of the things that I want us to think about is chiastic structure. Um, chiasm is from the Greek word key, which is an X. Chiastic structure, if you've studied literature in the Bible, maybe you've had classes on this, I do not know. But the, this is throughout the Bible in multiple areas. And what a chiastic structure is, it can be one verse long, it can be in a, the entire length of a book. But what it is, is it's, it's repetition. In the ancient world, they didn't have PowerPoints, they didn't have stuff like that. So what you see is they're trying to show you what the main thought is. Here you can see that A and A mimic each other. This is taken from Genesis 6, verses 2 through eight. And so let's read that passage together, verses two through eight, and I'll leave that up on the board that we'll look at. We'll talk about this in just a moment. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob as God Almighty. But my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say, therefore, to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you up out from the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, and to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for your possession. And let's just, for I am the Lord. And let's just read verse 9. Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. And so in verses 6 through 2, six, chapter 6, verses 2 through 8, you have a chiastic structure. And when it's broken down, you can see how the beginning and the end mimic each other. So the beginning, I am Yahweh. Verse 8, I am Yahweh. B, I have made a covenant. Then later it says, I will fulfill the covenant I have made. Then C, I have heard the people groaning under the Egyptians. C, I will rescue the people from Egypt. And there in the middle you have the main thrust or thought of what is being said here in verses 6 
verses 2 through 8 of chapter 6, I am Yahweh. Just what he says, I was known as God Almighty, El Shaddai, but now I'm going to be known as Yahweh. And so that's the thrust. And chiastic structure is all over the Bible. Uh, there are literally books that have been printed. Sometimes you look at them and go, that, that's good stuff right there. And sometimes you see something like, eh, it's a little bit of a stretch, but I, you know, I can see it. And so, but it is very popular in biblical literature. Um, Verses uh, 2 through 13. Let's pick back up and let's read verses uh, 10 through 13 and finish out that section. So the Lord said to Moses, Go in, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the people of Israel go out of the land. But Moses said to the Lord, Behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? For I am of uncircumcised lips. But the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a charge about the people of Israel and about Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to bring the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. And so here, this new revelation of God's name, what we just talked about in that chiastic structure, from the previous slide. I am Yahweh. The significance of this new name. We've been talking about this for several weeks because when Moses is on Mount Sinai and he's at the burning bush, God tells him that he is going to be known by a new name. And what is that name? Yahweh, right? And what does God say is going to be tied to his name, to this particular name? That's right. Him freeing the people of Egypt. When we see God give a new name for Himself in the book of Genesis, it's always tied to a covenant or to an event. And so it is no surprise to us, because we are in chapter 6, that God has said this like three or four times already, that His, his new name is going to be Yahweh, and it's going to be tied to this great event where He's going to lead the people out of Egypt. No one could have possibly done this except God Himself. And this is going to be His new name. And so He says that this is going to be a new revelation of his name. He had revealed himself as Elohim to the patriarchs, but now he's going to be known as Yahweh. Now, one of the things that's interesting is if you look at the Hebrew Old Testament, there's Yahweh written and mentioned in the book of Genesis, which is obviously before Exodus. And so this likely doesn't mean that they had never heard the name Yahweh before, uh, but that the nature and significance of that name was not yet revealed to the people until God delivered them out of the land of Egypt. Now before you say this is a stretch, think about that in the way that we think about the Messiah or, or, or Christ. Obviously, you know, uh, Messiah or um, is what we call Messiah, is the Hebrew. Christos is the Greek. They both mean the anointed one. And so looking at the Old Testament, we can see the promises of the Messiah, of the Messiah. But we didn't really fully understand who the Messiah was, what His purpose was, and what was going to happen. We talked about Sunday morning, the mystery of Christ from uh, Ephesians chapter 3 verses 1 through 13 Paul says that even the angels in heaven didn't fully understand what Christ was going to do when he came and so did we know before Christ came about the Messiah or the Christos yes but we didn't really fully know his nature and what he was who he was and what that meant for us until after Christ came so this is perhaps saying that they'd never not never heard of the name Yahweh but they never fully understood who he was or the nature behind that meaning and so it is interesting um God's providential promise in verses 4 through 8. He had promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he would deliver their descendants and give them the land of Canaan. This is mentioned to uh, Abraham in Genesis 12, Genesis 15, Genesis 17, to Isaac in Genesis chapter 24, and then to Jacob in Genesis chapter 50. And so it says that God heard their cries and remembered his covenant. Now, did God forget the covenant that he had made to the patriarchs? No, right? But this idea of remembrance, right? The time was, was there for him to fulfill what he had remembered, what he had done to the patriarchs in the, um, in the previous generations. And so the people are told about the good news. And what is their reaction in this passage, what we just read? The text tells us what, what happened when they told them. They don't listen, right? Right? Because why? Why don't they listen? This is the good news I've been waiting for. 400 years. They were down in the spirits. Yeah. The text tells us they were down in the spirits, right? Why? What had just happened? 
Remember chapter 4? Moses and Aaron get there at the end of chapter 4 and say, Hey guys, we came from God. We're His messengers. We're going to get you guys out of slavery and to prove it here. Boom. Here's a staff turning into a snake. Oh, boom. Here's a handful of leprosy. And they're partying and they're worshiping God and everybody's having a good time. They're like, yeah, you go talk to Pharaoh, Moses. You tell him we're getting out of here. And then Moses does and guess what happens? <laughs> it don't go their way, right? And so now God says, you go back to the people that they're getting out of here. And so that's what Moses and Aaron do. They go back and say, hey guys, we're telling you guys again, we're leaving this place. God's going to free you. And they're like, Whatever, dude. Like, I don't, we don't believe you. The last time you tried this, you just made it worse. Just shut up and leave us alone, right? Just, <laughs> you made it worse last time. You're just going to make it worse this time, right? And so they're just, they're, they're not very enthused about the situation they found themselves in. And so Moses is somewhat depressed. Depressed may be a strong word to use here, but he, he's having his own doubts, right? I mean, he's, he's having his own issues in believing this promise is going to be fulfilled, right? Because God tells him on the mountain, I'm going to send you, you're going to ask Pharaoh to go, and Pharaoh's not going to listen to you. And then Moses gets there, he's riding on a, a spiritual high when they're worshiping God and the people are all excited, and then Pharaoh starts beating the Israelites, and he tells God, why did you even send me here? Right? I mean, why, why, why are we even doing this? I mean, it didn't work the first time. And then once again, God tells Moses, I done told you, you're going to see in like four chapters, God's going to tell Moses six times that Pharaoh's heart's going to be hardened, that he's going to put obstacles in their path, but he's not going to be able to stop God from freeing the people. And you see Moses' faith tested, and eventually you see that faith grow throughout this uh, series of ten plagues we're going to look at starting in chapter 7. Any questions or comments on verses uh, 2 through 13? Brother Ricky. What was the purpose of having so many different uh, uh, tribes to against the Pharaoh? God could have done it the first time. Yeah. Uh, that time, Why did he it's a great question. And if you couldn't hear Brother Ricky said, why, why was there so many signs and wonders? Why was there so many things done? And I think it goes back to what we see with the first time that Moses goes to Pharaoh in the beginning of chapter 5. He says, you know, Yahweh. He says, who's this Yahweh? You know, I don't, I don't know the Lord. And then Moses comes back and says, so that you may, every time there's a plague, Moses says, so that you and the Egyptians may know the Lord. And so I think each time it's God showing the Egyptians and showing the Israelites who He is. You know, He is the God that can send the hail and the frogs and the death of the firstborn. Like He, that's His power. He's... Absolutely. I think, just like Brother Ricky said, it's just as much a learning for the Israelites as it was for Pharaoh. I think absolutely, because not only do you see the faith of Moses grow in the, through the ten plagues, you also see the faith of the Israelites grow. I mean, and even then, it's not that impressive, right? Because see all these plagues, spoiler alert, we'll get to the wilderness, and <laughs> their faith is not very good even then, right? Even while seeing all these signs and wonders. And so I think it's to show the Israelites the nature of God just as much as it is for the Egyptians. Absolutely. I think that's a, a good assessment. Good. And so, verses 9 through 13, we see this lack of faith. Uh, the people of Israel lack faith. Moses lacks faith. Pharaoh lacks faith. I mean, everybody lacks faith that God is going to be able to do what He says He's going to do. And yet, God reiterates time and time again this is going to take place. Watch and see. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, when you got a billion or billion and a half people, I'll get going in the same direction. Yeah. Yeah. It's like Stacy said, if you can hear her, it's hard to get, she said it's hard to get to a million to a million and a half people going in the same direction. It's hard enough to get five or six people, <laughs> right? If you've ever been on a committee, right, or inside of a group, right, it's hard to get five or six or 15 people on the right track, right, let alone, you know, an entire nation of people, right? So that's a good, good point. Yeah. Yeah. I think what Moses is trying to say there is that as a Hebrew, he is looked down upon by the Egyptians. They're a slave class. And so Moses, God says, you're going to go and you're going to tell Pharaoh this. And he's like, who am I to talk to Pharaoh? 
You know, like who, you know, um, and so he just means that uh, to Egyptian society and the Pharaoh, like who, who am I to go stand in front of Pharaoh and tell him to let his, to let your people go? You know, I can't, I can't do it. It's too, you're asking too much of me. And God says, no, we're going to, you're going to go. Didn't Pharaoh already know Moses? Did he grew up in the house of his daughter? Uh, perhaps. It's highly likely um, that they knew each other. Now, the Bible tells us that the Pharaoh that sought Moses' life had died when he was in Midian. And so this is a different Pharaoh. But if he was raised in Pharaoh's house, natural line of succession, then they, he probably was at least acquainted with whoever this Pharaoh was. But he had still chosen to be a Hebrew, not an Egyptian. And so that would have been a stench. You know, even going back to Joseph's day, 400 years earlier, the Egyptians wouldn't even eat with the Hebrews. And that's back when Joseph was, you know, on pretty good graces with the Egyptians. You know, good, good comment. Excellent. The next thing that we're going to see, this is a chart, and this is really hard to see, and I apologize. But in verses 14 through 30, we're not going to read. It is the genealogy of Moses and Aaron. Particularly, actually, Aaron, because Aaron is going to be the high priest, and the high priesthood is going to run through him. But they're both from the tribe of Levi. And so if you can see this in Exodus chapter 6, 14 through 30, the focus is on Moses and Aaron being from the tribe of Levi, and thus already setting up the reason for the Arianic priesthood and the Levitical priesthood. Now, one of the questions is, is that there seems to be only four generations from Levi to Moses in 400 years. Some commentators say that simply cannot be the case. Some say, well, if you look at 1 Chronicles chapter 7 through 22 to 27, Joshua is probably one or two generations younger than Moses, and there's ten generations given in the line of Joshua. So maybe this genealogy has some skips in it. Maybe, but, but... The ages of the men of, in this line are given. Levi lives for 137 years. Kohath lives for 133 years. Amram lives for, 100 and, uh, lives for 137 years. And we do know that Aaron is 83 and Moses is uh, 80. And so this does make it possible that if, if they were born at the end of the lives of these men, which is completely plausible, that there was only four generations that took place. And so... Uh, there's no reason to doubt the Bible's claim there's four generations from uh, Levi to Moses. As we look at the genealogy, like I said, we're not going to read it, but there are some interesting things. You can see this one a little bit better. So Levi, Kohath, Amram, Aaron, Eliezer, and Phineas, right? One of the things that's interesting is, anybody see a name on their name, Korah? What's he famous for? That's uh, Korah's Rebellion. Korah's Rebellion. He was first cousins to Aaron and Moses. <coughs> right? And so when Aaron and Moses kill Korah and their family, they're killing their first cousin and their first cousin's wives and kids and stuff. And so uh, is your relationship with God supposed to mean more to you than your relationship with your family? Yeah. When, when, when God says he's going to kill Korah and you have Moses say, like, oh, you can't do that, Lord. He's my first cousin. You know? So, once again, it's interesting. there's some interesting things in this genealogy we'll talk about. Obviously, in verse 24, Korah, who led Korah's rebellion in the wilderness in number 16, was a first cousin of Moses and Aaron. Korah and a large portion of his family were killed because of his desire for power and influence. Aaron and Moses were setting themselves up through God to be the leaders of the nation. And Korah was like, we got the same granddad. What makes them better than me? Right? So pride and arrogance right there from a familial aspect. Something that we're probably not, not new with. Another interesting thing. Verse 20. Amram is who? Moses' dad. Marries his aunt. Jochebed is the aunt of Amram. Um, these are the parents of Moses and Aaron. It's interesting because under the law of Moses given at Sinai, this marriage would have been forbidden against the law. Leviticus 18, 12. But was it forbidden before the law? Well, obviously not because Amram and Jochebed get married and that's his aunt. Interesting, strange, but... Uh, verse 23, uh, Elisheba, the wife of Aaron, is from the tribe of Judah. Her dad, Amidadab, and her brother at Nashon are direct ancestors of King David, Ruth 4.20, and direct ancestors of Jesus Christ, Matthew chapter 1, verse 4. 
And so uh, it's Aaron's wife, Elisheba, is Jesus' 20th great aunt. And so just interesting connection there. Um, like I said from this passage, some interesting things here. Four generations from Levi to Moses. Um, Amram marries his aunt Jochebed, which is against the law of Moses, but obviously that's not in effect at this time. Elisha, the wife of Aaron, is from the tribe of Judah, and her dad is a direct ancestor of both King David and Jesus. Korah is Moses and Aaron's first cousin. And verses 26 to 27 is another chiasm. And so, didn't read 14 through 30, but it is an interesting text for some of those things that we see in there. Um, Aaron and Moses, A, the very bottom, Moses and Aaron. Uh, B, bring people out of Egypt, led the people out of Egypt. C, what is the main thrust of verses 26 through 27? It's got a star beside it. C, they talk to Pharaoh, right? And let's just read verses 26 and 27. It's short, but just so you can see this chiastic structure. These are the Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, Bring out the people of Israel from the land of Egypt by their hosts. It was they who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, about bringing the people out of Israel from Egypt, this Moses and this Aaron. And so the point of that, those, that section, that little paragraph, is that these two guys talk to Pharaoh. Right? Korah says, we're just as important as Moses and Aaron. No, you're not. Because God didn't pick you to be the leaders of the nation. Well, how do you know he picked them too? Because they talked to Pharaoh. Like that, that sets them apart. And so that's the point of that verse. Anybody any have questions or comments on the genealogy of 14 through 30? Genealogies aren't the most riveting portions of Scripture, but there are some cool things that can be seen in there, right? And so, good. All right, verses 1 through 13. Let's read that together. We'll break it up and let's read 1 through 7 first. And the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. And you shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people go of Israel out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I will multiply my, my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my host of my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. The Egyptians shall know Know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring them, the people of Israel from among them. Moses and Aaron did so. They did just as the Lord commanded them. Now Moses was 80 years old and Aaron was 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. And so verses 1 through 7, the message chain. God's word is going to go to who? Moses. Moses' word is going to go to Aaron. And Aaron's word's going to go to Pharaoh, right? And so everything goes through Moses. So even though that Aaron is the spokesman of Moses, everything goes through Moses, who's getting his words directly from God. And so God, once again, right? When you see this time and time again, where the children of Israel are down in the dumps, Moses is down in the dumps, and God commissions Moses again for the third or fourth time saying, this is what you're going to do, and this is going to work. It's going to take some time. Pharaoh's going to harden his heart. I'm going to harden his heart. But stay faithful, and I'm going to deliver the people out of Egyptian bondage. Um, I threw out some numbers uh, last class. How many times does the Bible say that God hardened Pharaoh's heart? There is going to be a test at the end of this class. Do you remember? Six. Not six. Ten. Ten, right? The text says God hardened Pharaoh's heart ten times. How many times does the Bible say that Pharaoh hardened his own heart? Ten. Ten times, right? And so ten times both times. I think that's, I think that's important for us because the question always is, what does it mean, right? God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Uh, Joey? Uh, Christina said ten. Christina, yeah. Christina said ten both times. <laughs> And so everybody else better step it up, right? And so Christine's like, I'll never say another word again. <laughs> Sorry, Christine, it was Joey's fault. He brought it up. Um, and so um, I think the best illustration of this is anybody ever have any siblings? <coughs> Some of you did, right? Um, we went to go see uh, Miss 
uh, Gillum today, uh, Miss Linda, and she said, uh, she said, yeah, I was one of ten. It's like, what is in the water around here? I'm like, you know, we got, I got the Smiths and the Darties, and now I got the Reese's with 10. You know, that's, a, that's probably more in here that I don't know about. I was like, man, like, there's all kinds of kids running around here. Um, but anyways, anybody know what button to push on your sibling to get them mad? Like, you, you just knew. Okay, what about your spouse? Anybody know the button on your spouse to push? Anybody? Okay, bring it closer to home, all right? You know, there's a button that you can push and you know what reaction you're going to get out of that sibling. Now, are you overriding that sibling's free will? No, but you know that person well enough where if you do something, it's going to cause a certain type of reaction. I think that's what we see here with the ten times that Pharaoh hardens his heart and the ten times that God hardens Pharaoh's heart. I don't think we see free will being overridden. I think the Lord knows Pharaoh and his weaknesses. And I think Pharaoh is a pompous, arrogant ruler who thinks he's a god on earth. And so God plays with that a little bit. Um, yes, John? Weren't there ten plagues as well? Ten plagues? It... Ten commandments? Ten times he hardened his heart. Yep, maybe. It's just a reoccurring theme. Yeah, and so you do see ten popping up a lot in Exodus when we go with that go with that route, right? Uh, ten times hardened heart, ten times God hardened his heart, ten uh, commandments, ten plagues. So, yeah, interesting. I hadn't thought about that, but it's interesting to see that pop up. Right? Um, good, good. God will stretch out his mighty hand. Let's read verses 8 through 13. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, Prove yourselves by working a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your staff and cast it down before Pharaoh, that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his, serv and his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and sorcerers, and, they, and the magicians of Egypt also did the same by their secret arts. For each man cast down his staff, and they became serpents, but Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Still Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them, as the Lord had said. And so Aaron throws down his staff. Now it's interesting here, whose staff is it? Well, I think it could be God's rod, which is what it's called in Exodus. It's also called Moses' staff, and it's also called Aaron's staff. I think it is that Aaron just happens to be the one that throws his staff down. I would say it's the same staff in Exodus chapter 4 that Moses has. That he throws down on the ground. It becomes a serpent. God tells him to pick it back up. And then we get to the end of chapter 4, and we see Moses and Aaron doing that again and convincing the people that they're spokesmen from God. Um, so Aaron's staff or Moses' staff, whoever staff it is, it throws it down. Now there's two words that are used. Nachish is used in Exodus chapter 4 about the staff, and it means a serpent, right? A snake. The word that is used here is thanin, which means either a monstrous snake, and it's also used for crocodile in Hebrew. And so did Aaron throw down the, ser the, the staff and it become a serpent or a crocodile? Probably a serpent, right? But it's a, it's, it's a big serpent, right? It's not, some, it's not a garden snake. You know what I'm saying? Like it's a, or, I mean, a garden snake can be big, right? It's, okay, it's not a, you guys know what I'm talking about. It's a good sized snake. Then so Aaron does this. The Egyptian magicians do the same. And so um, the question is how, everybody has this question. Anybody have any questions on this section? Pretty good magician. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> to appear when the uh, Egyptian threw down the Yeah. Why you got Yeah. Great questions. I think it was Caleb. Did you say uh, who's Rob? Yeah, okay. Rob asked the question that everybody has when we get to this section is, how did the Egyptians throw down their staffs and they become snakes? Right? And so Brother Ed, Brother Ed had the exact same question. Why did God allow that to take place or what happened? Well, there's three possibilities as to what takes place here in this text. First possibility, God did it as a way to harden Pharaoh's heart, possibly. The idea that they throw down their staffs, God allows it to become snakes, and then shows his power and dominance over them by Aaron's snake devouring the other snakes. Possibly number one. Everybody understand that possibility? 
Okay, all right. So God is the, the, the mover in the Egyptian staffs. The second one is that Satan is the one by demonic powers who is able to turn the staff into serpents. And then God shows his power over demonic magical forces by eating the staffs. That's possibly number two. Now, I don't, I don't really put much stock in number two. I've heard number two by various people, but I, I, I don't think that's number two is the right one. Or number three, that the magicians of that time, by sleight of hand or whatever it was, had some sort of trick where they convinced people that their staffs were becoming serpents, and then God uses this popular Egyptian trick, sleight of hand, magician, whatever we want to call it, and then God shows that he's the one who's really able to take a staff, turn it into a serpent, and eat the other ones. Those are pretty much the three ones. Anybody got any other ones? What did the verse say about the, using their dark secrets? Is that what I said? Yeah, their secret acts is what I believe my translation said. Yeah, did the same by their secret arts. Now, whether no, what is that? Is that demonic powers or is that sleight of hand? Right? I mean, what what is that? I, mean, I don't know. Right? I feel like Pharaoh knew in advance that his, his wise men had the ability. Yeah. Well, I'm with you. I think, I mean, number th option number three is tempting. This was something that they had done before to kind of, you know, to kind of, whether it was sleight of hand or whether it was, you know, legit, whatever it was, that this was something that God was going to use to show his dominance over Pharaoh. Like I would, I, I could, I could lean, I could see that, like you were saying, that this was something that wouldn't have been a shock to Pharaoh, I guess you would say. No, I mean, if we get to heaven, it's like, oh, yeah, Satan totally did it. I'm like, well, I'm going to be mad, right? Like, well, then you're wrong, Moses. It's like, I was there. Like, you know, it's like, a, all right, never mind. So the question is, I don't know. And that, but but the, the takeaway is that's not the important part of the text, right? Sometimes we get so hung up on how do the magicians, and we forget the snakes got eaten by God's staff, right? I mean, sometimes we forget that the actual purpose of the text is to show God's dominance and power. Whether it's dominance and power over the dark arts, or whether it's dominance and power over, you know, fake religion, or Pharaoh's arrogance, the main takeaway is that God's power can't be stopped or defeated, right? So we can't let the questions overview what the actual takeaway from the text actually is. So... But it is, it is tempting to speculate and try to figure out what it is, all right? And so, good. Um, any other questions or comments on verses 7 through 13? It is, it is. And so, it's a wonderful question by Corley. And so she said, is it Nachish or is it Thanin for the serpents of the magicians, right? Is there, are there crocodiles too or are big monstrous snakes or is it, you know, the regular word for serpent? And it's Thanin, the same one as used for Aaron's rod. Um, obviously not as powerful because one rod is eating multiple rods from the other ones. And so, great, great question. Any other questions or comments? Any ideas you have on the staff that you would like to say? Anybody? Them? No? All right. Good. Good. Um, we got through an entire class this time, right? I mean, it was only a chapter and a half, and we skipped like, you know, 16 verses to the genealogies. But, you know, a win's a win. Um, and so what are some takeaways we see from this passage? Number one, pain is momentary. Um, God is victorious, but we still might experience pain in the process. Uh, I think this is also important. While trying to accomplish what God wants you to do in life, you may experience pain and disappointment. Oftentimes we feel like if we experience pain and disappointment in life, then this isn't what God wants for us in our life. Well, no, what God wants for you is to be faithful, and sometimes that faithfulness may cause momentary pain. But we have to remember, like Moses and the Israelites, that despite the momentary pain, God keeps His promises. The Israelites and Moses run into the first sign of adversity, and they're ready to quit. I mean, they're just like, we're done. Like, this is uncomfortable for us, and we don't want to do it anymore. I mean, we, we pile on the Israelites like crazy. But how many times in our own life, if we're honest, if we've tried to live the Christian life, and it got uncomfortable 
or maybe a little bit painful, and we're like, you know what, God, this is really uncomfortable. I don't think I want to do it, or I'm going to do my own version. I'm going to have my own way. I think if we're honest with ourselves, we're a lot closer to the Israelites than we would like to be. But even if the pain is momentary, we can press through that if we remember and know that God keeps His promises. Uh, number three, you see a compassion for others. Moses is compassionate for the Israelites. God's compassion for the Israelites and God's compassion for us. Uh, and number four, um, ultimate victory, right? Uh, despite the Pharaohs that you have in your life, despite the pain, despite the obstacles, if God says something is going to happen, something is going to happen. Um, if God has promised us that the things that we have to go through in this life can't even compare to the glory that is waiting for us in heaven. I mean, the Apostle Paul says that as humans, we can't even fathom with our wildest imaginations what heaven is going to be like. I believe that. Like, I, I believe that part of the Bible, and I hope you do too. And it's that, that faith that when those trials and that momentary pain comes up, you know, Paul says, don't worry about it. You know, because you, you, you can't imagine what the ultimate victory in heaven is going to be like. And if we don't lose sight of that, then the momentary pain is not going to keep us from being faithful. Um, questions or comments on our takeaways or anything that you see that for your own takeaway? No? The cold's got everybody quiet tonight, so that's okay. And so, uh, well, good. Well, it's good to see each and every one of you had a wonderful uh, attendance for our class. Looking forward to seeing all of you uh, Sunday uh, for worship. And let's go ahead and let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the blessing it is to come together during the middle of the week and to study Your Word. Dear Heavenly Father, please help us to be avid students of Your, your Word so we can increase our knowledge uh, in You and what You are like and what You expect of us as Your children. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the faithfulness despite adversity of men like Moses and Aaron. We're thankful for the example that we have through them and the ultimate example that we have through Your Son. And dear Heavenly Father, we realize that each and every individual in this congregation has pain and suffering in their life in some way or another, that we all have various trials and temptations. Dear Heavenly Father, please help us to be able to look past the momentary pain, to be able to look past the momentary afflictions that we have as Christians, and to be able to take hope rooted in your promises of victory in Christ Jesus, that we can look forward to that day that we get to spend eternity with you in heaven, and help us to have that as our motivation to get through this life and its trials. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for that hope that is in your Son, and it's in His name we pray. Amen.